Hi everyone, welcome to uh, class number two in international politics. Today we're going to look at the uh, first of the theories that we're going to see in this course, um, and this is um, realism. So we'll do classical realism and neorealism. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we start with realism. Um, first, uh, in terms of kind of the uh, early years of um, uh, international relation theory, or at least modern international relation theory, uh, and particularly during the Cold War period, realism was the, the dominant um, theory. Um, and so in kind of in terms of the trajectory, it's a good starting place to go with kind of the, the one that was uh, developed um, earliest, or at least came to prominence earliest. Um, second is that um, because of its uh, kind of central role in international relations theory, most of many of the other theories that um, we see in IR kind of talk about how they're different to realism. So they respond uh, to kind of, you know, the dominance of realism, or at least the early dominance of realism, the centrality of it. And so they try to present themselves uh, in terms of, you know, this is what realism gets wrong, and this is how we correct it. Um, or even they may even be saying realism gets pretty much everything wrong, but they still kind of frame their initial theory in terms of, you know, a response to realism. So that, so given that that's something that we're going to see when we're talking about some of these other theories in other weeks, um, it's a nice place to start um, with realism itself. Um, so before we can um, get into realism, um, there's a couple of uh, uh, terms or distinctions we're going to want to be making. Um, so a lot of the IR theories um, that we're going to be looking at, including realism, um, assume that individuals or states or and or states are rational actors. Uh, and so this isn't just going to be unique to realism. Uh, probably the first uh, three theories we're going to be seeing in the course are going to be uh, so liberalism and neoliberal institutionalism are going to be making um, very similar assumptions. Um, so it's good to kind of just get an understanding of what rationality means. And we can we could probably dedicate an entire um, course uh, or certainly an entire lecture to the debates on uh, rationality. So we're just going to keep it simple for our purposes here. Um, so rationality implies uh, purposeful behavior. Decision makers choose the means that helps them achieve their desired goals. Right, so they have particular goals and they think about what are the different options that are possible to achieve these goals. They think of what are the costs and the benefits and what are the likelihood of success for them. And then they choose to see the means um, that, or the option that is best given probability of success, given costs and given, um, and given benefits, right? So um, now different schools of rationality um, go, uh, you know, some have thicker assumptions about what exactly this means, um, how much people you know, are, are calculating and weighing all the different options. But for us, we're just think about it in terms of purposeful behaviors, choosing the means that best help them uh, achieve the desired ends. Uh, and an imp another important starting place um, for much of our discussion of um, IR is the distinction between domestic and international politics. Um, and this isn't without um, some level of debate. Um, there's, there's, you know, um, definitely schools of thought that push against this kind of division between uh, domestic and international politics, um, saying that, you know, there's actually a lot more similarities than kind of we pretend when we talk about the difference between international politics and, say, other areas of, um, of political science. Um, and so there is some debate here, but typically when we talk about domestic politics, we talk about it as hierarchical, right? So we have different levels. So like say us as when we're behaving, you know, we know that there's different levels of government above us um, who are setting rules and regulating what we're allowed to do. Um, so you can even kind of map out kind of like structures of, you know, you've got the prime minister um, or the courts or, or whatnot at the top, and then you've got different layers going down to the individual people. So you have people who are enforcing, you know, you have those who are creating the laws and then you have those who are enforcing them. And then you have the, you know, the people who are subject to those laws. So, you know, most of the people. Um, international politics, conversely, is anarchic. And so we started talking about this last time, um, but essentially it means there's no central authority. So unlike in domestic politics, where we've got that central government, where, you know, if someone commits a crime, we, we can have recourse to complain and the government will step in. Um, in international politics, we don't have this type of authority. So if another state goes and does something we don't like, we don't have this world government where we can go and say, hey, they broke this law, can you step in and punish them? 
Now, some do point to things like, you know, the UN um, or stuff like that. You know, the UN is Security Council that can authorize the use of force in response to conflict. So some say, you know, this is some element of um, hierarchy, but the UN still isn't a world government. It still operates on the consent of the different, um, you know, parties involved, right? So the UN is not going to be doing anything unless the different states with, who make up the UN agree to it. So the UN itself has very little decision-making authority in and of itself. So um, you never know, for example, you know, typically speaking, if, if I'm going to commit a crime domestically, I know that there's a fairly, I could get lucky, but there's a fairly high probability that I'm going to be stopped by the police and arrested and, and go to jail. Um, if in international politics, um, I commit a crime, there's much less likelihood that, um, and that someone's going to come and punish me, particularly if I'm big and strong. Um, because, you know, it takes the other states to go and authorize it. The UN doesn't really have a stand, doesn't have a standing army of its own to come in. So um, while there may be a lot of complaining in terms of getting punished, um, there's that, no central authority that can manage that. And finally, power is a, is a concept that we'll return to a little bit later in the course, um, but it's going to be it's something that the real uh, realist theories, in particular, when we talk about classical realism, um, are going to talk about. Uh, so just a brief definition of, um, of power. So um, we're going to use the definition that was created by a, a famous political scientist named Robert Dahl. And according to his definition, power is the ability of actor A to get actor B to do what actor B would not otherwise do. And so features of this definition where you have to, uh, that are required for this to be an action to be an exercise in power. So the outcome must be intended by actor A, right? So if actor B ends up doing something that was never intended by actor A, that wasn't A exerc exercising power. That may, may, may be happy luck, uh, it may be bad luck, but it's not an exercise in power. It's only if actor B does something that actor A intended actor B to do that we'd be seeing an exercise of power. The desire of actor A and actor B must be in conflict, right? So if actor B does the thing that actor A would like actor B to do, but actor B wanted to do it already, then that's not an exercise of power. That's just actor B doing what they already wanted to do. Um, so taking kind of, let's take Canada and the US again, right? Um, say uh, the U uh, Canada is asking the US to change a, uh, a policy on trade. Um, between the two countries, right? So we want uh, the U.S. is doing, make it a, uh, has put in place a policy, um, or is doing something um, that's hurting Canada trade-wise, um, and the U.S. ends up changing its policy, right? So that sounds like an exercise in power because Canada has to do uh, do so, um, and uh, and the U.S. did so. But if the U.S. kind of thought about and looked at the policy and, and said, "Hey, wait, actually, this policy was bad for us too." Right? So it wasn't anything about Canada making the request. It was that the US just reviewed its policy and said, this is dumb for us as well. This is hurting us as well. We're going to change it. Right? There wasn't actually a conflict between the two sides. It would be an exercise in power if the US really likes the policy that it had in place, but it changed it because Canada asked. That would be an exercise in policy, right? because the US liked what it was doing, but it changed it only because of what Canada asked it to do. Um, and the third requirement is actor A has the material um, and or ideational resources to change actor B's behavior, right? So um, it has to either have the um, material, so money, guns, bombs uh, type thing, so, um, or ideas, so cultural attractiveness, things like that, uh, resources to be able to change B's behavior. So there has to be some form of either attractiveness so that um, you know, the U.S. changes its behavior because it wants to please Canada because of something attractive about Canada. So that could be ideational resources um, or kind of status where, um, again, um, in this particular example, that's a little bit harder to believe some of these, but has the status that, you know, the U.S. feels like it should change its behavior because of Canada's status um, or material. So that saying that we could either punish them economically or militarily. If they don't do what we want to do, we could invade or um, cause military damage, which would be causing them to do so. So in many cases, in terms of, for example, material, if we're talking about Canada asking the US to do something, on the, from the material side, Canada 
could not be exercising power against the US. We don't really have the material power to be doing so. Ideationally, maybe we do, um, particularly in certain cases. Um, but even then, um, it, that's not necessarily as likely. So classical realism has existed for longer amounts of time. Some um, theorists try to push it back to all the way to, you know, theorists in ancient Greece saying realism is this long tradition. Uh, I'm typically a little bit less comfortable with that, but classical realism then we can at least say, you know, has been around in, um, you know, the earliest 20th century, mid 20th century um, was one of the central theories. Um, it's since been kind of replaced um, more prominently with a more systemic level. Uh, one which we'll get to next, um, but classical realism. So power is the primary goal in politics, um, and so and and why do we want power? Well, they root this in human nature. Um, so um, according to uh, classical realism, people um, have this ingrained uh, desire to accumulate as much power as possible. Um, and the reason, and it, it depends on the classical realist where they get this conception of human nature. Some of them get it from religion, kind of, you know, um, uh, some get it from history. So just looking at recurring wars and how so much people have fought, how throughout human history people seem to have uh, fought over power. And then some look at psychological studies of human nature to see that people seem to have this psychological need for power. But wherever they, 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 get it, so that differs um, uh, where, where the kind of the inspiration is for this belief in uh, desire of power being rooted in human nature. But whatever it is, people, and therefore in the international politics state, states as a result, as a kind of a vehicle for people, desire to accumulate as much power as possible. So in domestic politics, individuals are rational actors pursuing their own uh, self-interest. So remember, this would be because this is people desire power, right? Human nature for power. This would be true in domestic politics and international politics, where the difference we'll see between domestic politics and international politics is how this is exercised, right? So in domestic politics, individuals are rational actors pursuing their own self-interest. So each person within society is trying to do as best as they can for themselves, accumulate as much power. That could be in terms of you know societal influence. It could be in terms of economic resources, um, stuff like that. But in domestic politics, the government limits the ability of individuals to pursue their self-interest, right? So the government sets in place laws where, you know, there's certain things I can't do to accumulate more power. Um, if I want, you know, if, um, I, if I want more resources, I can't just walk into a bank with a gun and just take more money. Um, if I really like the look of your laptop, I can't just take it off your desk. Uh, or if I like your property, I can't just walk in and murder you and take your property. Right, because the government can say, you know, these are things that you're not allowed to do, and they have the power to punish me. The government's always stronger than me, and so the government has the power, or me or any other person, and so the government has the ability to limit what I can do in terms of my self-interest. So I'm still going to try to maximize. I'm still going to rationally try to maximize my own self-interest, but I'm going to do it within fairly severe constraints. Right. So when I'm calculating the cost-benefit, you know, if there's no government, then you know, somebody might ca calculate the cost benefits of murder to take property and say, okay, well, there's high benefits. I get this property, no costs, really, as long as I'm strong enough to, to do it. Um, the calculus changes within domestic politics because the benefits go severely down because I'm not going to be successful. I'm not going to actually, I, I could murder you, but I'm not going to be able to take control of your property because the government will step in and there's extremely high cost because I'm going to go to jail for a really long time. Um, so the rational policy, the, the rational choice then, if I want to maximize my own self-interest, is not to murder you to take your property, um, at least. Um, and, and so most of the time, it leads to stable expectations about what people are going to do. In international politics, states are rational actors pursuing the national interest, right? So um, we kind of aggregate up the state saying that there's something called the national interest. So Canada is pursuing its own national interest in terms of getting the most power. I mean, since the primary national interest is power, Canada is pursuing anything that increases Canada's power. Now in international politics, there's no government. So states are free to pursue their natural interest. Their in, uh, actions are only limited by their power. Uh, international politics, therefore, is a state of war. Um, so a, a few things to, to pursue on here. So, right, so in domestic politics, we are limited in what we could do 
Um, even if I was more powerful than someone, and so I could theoretically murder them, I'd be punished afterwards, um, right? So there were limitations um, on how I could exercise my, my self-interest, right? Because there's no world government in international politics, states are free to pursue their national interests without really fear of punishment. Um, the only place where they could fear punishment is if they're not sufficiently powerful to do so, uh, to, to you know, take uh, the action. Um, that they'd like to do. But if, they're, if, if the state is sufficiently powerful to do something, then there's no one who could really stop them from doing so. Um, and because therefore um, actions are only limited by their power, international politics um, is referred to as a state of war, right? This doesn't mean that um, saying that international politics is a state of war doesn't mean that everyone's always fighting everyone. Um, similarly, anarchy doesn't mean chaos, right? It just means that anarchy um, having no central government, right? That doesn't, um, uh, an anarchic international system where there's no central government could actually be incredibly ordered. Um, so not chaotic, in fact, very, very ordered. Um, and that's in fact, in most time periods, what we actually see is that um, there's a tremendous amount of order in international politics. Similarly, most of the time, most states are at peace with each other. Right in any given year, there's a very small. If we take like all the different kind of country pairings and look at all the different country pairings, very few of them are actually in a state of war with each other. Um, what it does mean, though, is that at any time, so the saying that international politics therefore is a state of war is more saying that at any time war can break out because there's no one to stop it. Right. So if somebody has more power than someone else and the other side's not able to get kind of the power resources to stop them, then one side could use uh, you know, violence or threat of war to get what it wants. Um, so it's more a statement that um, st war can break out at any time because of the lack of central authority. So again, kind of talked about how um, we, we kind of typically put, uh, you know, um, look back to classical philosophical texts or historical texts to kind of draw this long historical lineage to classical realism. Some point back all the way to kind of ancient Greece and uh, Thucydides writing about the history of the Peloponnesian War, you know, between Athens and Sparta. Um, and so this is one of the quotes that you often see kind of inspiring more modern classical realism. Um, so uh, since you know as well as we do that right as the world goes, it's only in question between equals in power, while the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must, right? So um, this is um, in a speech being given uh, between Athenians and uh, Melos when they're, um, and uh, Athens is invading uh, the island of Melos. And uh, the Melians are saying, you know, what you're doing is not right here. And the Athenian response is saying, um, questions of right and wrong only are applicable um, when you're talking about people who are equal in power. Because in reality, when there's a difference in power, the strong are able to do whatever the heck they want, and they don't have to justify it in terms of right and wrong. And the weak have to suffer what they must, right? They, the weak, because they don't have sufficient power to do something, they're not, a, you know, they have to take what they get. If the stronger one says, we're going to leave you alone, great for them. If the stronger one says they're going to invade or they're going to take this part of the land or they're going to come take these resources, They've got nothing they can do to stop and yelling about right and wrong doesn't matter, right? Uh, it's going to fall on deaf ears. If they're strong, right? If, if, if the millions were strong, right? And then they could come in and say, talk all they want about what's right because they have the power to back it up. And so they could, if the, mil if the Athenian said, we want this because we deserve this, the millions could say, no, you don't. And there could be some form of debate. Um, but um, when there's a difference in power, like there was in this case, um, that doesn't enter into the equation. And morality is actually um, an interesting topic when we're talking about classical realism. Um, and I'll bring it in to show what kind of a central um, kind of moral tenet of, um, of classical realism. And it's a different one than what we would normally think of, right? So morality, Classical realism, despite its emphasis on power, doesn't say morality doesn't matter, right? But what, um, what you always have to be aware of when you're thinking about morality is the distinction between desirable and possible, right? If you view something as 
you know, morally good, morally desirable, right? And so you undertake this endeavor because it's the morally desirable action to do, but you don't have the strength to do it, right? Um, then is it really moral to do so to, to, to fail, right? So you always have to consider before going out on any enterprise, is it possible to do? And kind of an extension of, quote, there could be no political morality without prudence. That is without consideration of the political consequences of seemingly moral action. Uh, realism then considers prudence, the weighing of the consequences of alternative political actions to be the supreme virtue in politics, right? So um, going out on kind of moral crusades, um, even if you've got the power to do so, right, without considering the consequences, long-term consequences, how does this affect your power resources long-term? Um, it, it can be very, very risky, right? So prudence, weighing of consequences of all alternative actions and choosing the one that best that has the best consequences for your power and for your ability to survive is the, the, the supreme virtue. Um, so being prudent, uh, and this is part of also then where you know classical realism, despite its emphasis on power, um, can also how, can help explain why we don't have constant state of war between different uh, countries. Because a prudent country must consider not only you know is it do we have the power to do something? But what are the likely consequences of doing so? So for example, the US in its relations with Canada, right? The US is more powerful than Canada. So the US could always tell Canada, you know, do this or else. Um, and the US would have the power to do so. But it also has to think about the consequences um, of doing so. So first it could um, get, Canada could seek allies to combat the US, which could pose a threat to the U.S.'s power resources, but also each time the U.S. has to exercise power against Canada, say if it were military force, right, Canada would resist somewhat at some cost to the U.S.'s power resources. The U.S. would inevitably win, but it would have to co be use coercion each time, which is costly. You would have to divert military resources, and economic resources to um, controlling Canada. And at the end of the day, yes, it would get everything it wants, but it would have to consider, is it doing so at a greater cost and benefit? It's sometimes letting Canada get away. Yes, it has the cost of not getting everything the US wants, but if it keeps things happy between the two countries, it may actually maintain its power resources better. So you still always have to be prudent. Are you over exercising your power resources? Um, are you actually getting a true benefit? Um, is the benefit worth the cost um, in terms of doing so? And so, um, Prudence is still important. That's not therefore saying that you know conquest is always the best action, uh, or war is always the best action. Um, and so that's kind of the the brief um, introduction to classical realism. Some classical realists still exist today, or some more modern versions of um, classical realism still exist today. Um, Neoclassical realism emerged in the, the 1990s, but you don't see much of classical realism anymore. Um, so the kind of the focus on human nature, um, it's since the uh, 1970s, um, late 1970s, early 1980s, more been replaced by what we refer to as neorealism. And neorealism is a system level theory, right? So remember when we talked last time about kind of levels of analysis, so we've got system, domestic, and individual. So classical realism with the focus on human nature was putting the explanation for conflict or, or cooperation, whatever we want to be explaining, was putting the explanation largely at uh, the individual level. So um, individuals acting. There's some element of system in terms of power resources and, and, and anarchy and stuff like that. Um, but the source of conflict, the source um, is to be found at, and um, you know, in human nature, and in individual choices and mistakes that individuals make. Uh, neorealism moves it up to the system level theory, so it removes the focus on human nature. Instead, neorealists argue that patterns we observe in international politics depend on the structure of the international system. So that's the structure is part of the system. Because remember, um, the system was the in relations between the different states. Um, and the rules and interactions that they have. Um, so it explains why very different actors when faced with similar situations behave similarly, right? So that's one of the um, major goals of neorealism is to try to find pattern, right? And ends up saying that domestic politics are kind of the internal characteristics of states don't matter. What really matters is the external constraints that they're facing. What is their situation? Um, 
And you'll find that states, even if they're very different domestically, if they're placed in very similar situations, will behave very similarly. And that's one of the goals of neorealism is to explain. So when we talk about the structure of international politics, um, what are we talking about? Um, and so Waltz identifies three characteristics that any structure has, right? So there's a domestic structure, there's an international structure, right? Um, there could be many different types of structures, right? But every different structure has three defining principles. It's ordering principle, character of the unit, and distribution of capabilities, right? So in international politics, um, the ordering principle is that international politics is anarchic, right? So no central authority. Conversely, domestic politics, the ordering principle would be hierarchy. Domestic politics is hierarchical. Character of the units is a second, right? And so in this case, in international politics, states are functionally identical. And so what does that mean? Because states have to provide for themselves, because states um, are, are sovereign over the territory, um, because there's no central authority for a variety of different reasons, states have to provide for all the different goods within their states, right? So every state has to provide for its own defense. Every state has to provide for its own people in terms of food resources, social services, education, infrastructure, so transportation, right? So every state has to be, that's not to say that every, you know, states are self-sufficient and have everything that they possibly need, not to say that they don't have to acquire resources, but they have to provide them themselves. So um, you don't have one state, okay, this state in the world is in charge of defense and this state in the world is in charge of food and this state in, uh, in the world is in charge of education, right? Um, so we don't have the education state. The education state, Canada is the education state, and the U.S. is the defense state, and Mexico is the food state. Um, we, we don't have that. Each state has to be able to provide for each of its own things. Um, conversely, at the domestic level, when we talk about character of the units, individuals are functionally differentiated, right? So we have people who specialize in plumbing, and people who specialize in farming, and people who specialize in education, right? Because I can specialize in education because I know that someone else you know, I could just go into the store and buy food, right? And um, I'm going to be able to do so because I would live in the state with rules, right? So I don't have to be completely self-sufficient as an individual. And then distribution of capabilities. And so in international politics, when we're talking about distribution of capabilities, we're focusing on the number of great powers. Um, and so neorealism will return to, it's very focused on great powers. Uh, and the number of great powers has played a very big role in the pattern of international politics. Um, and distribution of capabilities ends up being kind of the big area of explanation in neorealism, the, the big mover, right? Because if we look at these first two points, ordering principle, well, international politics is anarchic and that never really changes, right? So anarchy, besides kind of being a permissive condition for anything, it can explain change because anarchy is not changing. So if something's not changing, it can't explain change, right? So I couldn't explain why at one point we have a lot of war and at another point we have very little war. Anarchy doesn't, doesn't can't explain that. Um, character of the unit, states are functionally identical. Again, this is always the same. Um, so if states are always functionally identical, it can't explain any patterns. Um, or, and how, again, one period we have high cooperation, another period we have high conflict. Uh, states being functionally identical can't explain that. Distribution of capabilities, the number of great powers can change across time. So because it can change, it could also change, uh, explain changes of outcome, right? So it can, um, it could be, you know, number of great powers could be a cause of things like greater um, conflict in one period and less conflict in another period. Uh, and so that's something that neorealism ends up focusing on quite a bit. So we've talked about the structure in international politics, who are the units in international politics? Um, and we've already um, fo uh, talked about this a little bit, but the primary actors in, international, uh, uh, in the international system are states. Um, and so, Yes, there are other actors in international uh, politics. We already talked about multinational corporations a little bit. There's intergovernmental organizations like the UN, there's non-governmental organizations like uh, the Red Cross or Amnesty International, right? These exist, but realism, new realism does not really focus on them. Instead, they focus on the action of states and in particular focusing on the great powers because the great powers are sufficiently strong that they can influence um, patterns of behavior Weaker states, yes, you know, two small weak states can fight each other and have a local war, but it's going to have very little impact on the broader pattern of international relations. If two great powers have a war, 
right? They're going to be, um, because of their size, they're probably dragging in smaller states. And there's going to be, um, uh, and, and it may just spill over in itself into third parties who don't even want to be involved. Um, and so when great powers fight, there tends to be broader implications for the wider international system. Right, so we have all kinds of small wars that have no impact on something. Think about World War II, right? It started with relatively small number of countries, or World War I started with a relatively small number of countries. But because there are great powers, the number of countries who ended up being involved were immense. And the implications for the wider international politics, for the international economy, for everything was immense. Um, states are rational, unitary actors. Um, so again, um, states are rational. We've talked about they prefer, per, uh, they pursue purposeful goals. Unitary means that um, we don't really look within kind of how it's often referred to as the black box of domestic politics, right? So when we talk about uh, Canada in neorealism, we're, we're not looking at the debates within Canadian politics. We talk about Canada's national interest, Canada does. Um, so it's, um, Canada acts as one within international politics. Um, the United States acts as one. Um, so again, doesn't look at domestic politics, doesn't look at domestic debates. Um, and the, in international politics, the United States is acting as one actor uh, and united actor. Um, the primary goal um, is security. So unlike um, in uh, uh, classical realism where the primary goal is power, here the primary goal is security. States may have other goals, uh, but they're um, secondary to security, right? So for example, states also may desire wealth uh, and they can pursue wealth, right? But first they must make sure that um, they're, they've ensured their security and that their pursuit of wealth doesn't undermine their security. Power is still something that you know is desirable, but it's desirable as a means to achieving security, not as the end goal. So unlike in, uh, in classical realism where states wanted to pursue power for its own purpose or for its own ends, power was the goal. Here, power is a means to achieve security. Um, if it, um, if again, pursuing, uh, similar to what we talked about with classical realism, how, you know, sometimes taking actions, um, you know, could actually, uh, that seemingly seem like they could increase your power. If you look at the consequences, could actually decrease your power. Here again, like, um, pursuing certain wars could end up decreasing your security, right? So if you exercise power, if the US exercised power against Canada, right, it could do so. And it, in, in that sense, it would seem like it increases its power as an end or security. But what if attacking Canada gets everybody else to look at the US and say, hey, you're threatening, so we're all gonna band together with Canada and oppose the US. That could actually decrease the US's security. So in that case, maximizing power would actually be bad in the long-term interest of the United States. Self-help. Um, so uh, self-help is kind of an important implication that we, um, that um, neorealists uh, neo um, assign to kind of the pr pursuit of security in an anarchic world of rational unitary actors. So the anarchic nature of international system means that states live in a self-help world. States must provide for their own security because there's nobody above, there's nobody to guarantee you, uh, guarantee your security. You have to look out for yourself. You have to always be providing for number one. It doesn't mean that you can't sometimes help others or receive help from others, but you can never assume that it's coming, right? Because um, think about it, what happens, say you make an agreement with somebody else and um, you, you outsource the security saying, um, you know, we're going to trust you, uh, Canada's going to trust so-and-so to, and we make a contract with the, the U.S. to provide security for us, right? But we don't know that the U.S. is going to do so. At the end of the day, when we need help, the U.S. may not show up. And at that point, um, who do we go to to complain? We can't go to anybody to complain and say, oh, they broke this contract with us. At that point, well, A, we may already be dead if you know the other side invades, um, but there's also nobody to enforce the contract and say, hey, US, you did bad, you owe them something. Um, so states must be able to provide for their own security. That doesn't mean there's not alliances, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about alliances later, right? But it does mean that states must, must be able to provide for themselves. You can't be assuming that others could be coming to your help um, or, um, 
threats abound. Um, so states are uncertain about the intents of others. So there's always um, the international system is a place where there's a lot of threat. Um, it makes the assumption that states are uncertain about the intents of others. We never know what others want to do. Um, and this isn't just realism. I mean, many theories have always identified that knowing the intentions of others is, is incredibly difficult. Knowing, it's, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to know what our own intentions are, to look at somebody else and know what they actually want um, to be very difficult because most actions taken, right, could have multiple different designs. If somebody, um, you know, increasing their troop size because they want to be invading or somebody increasing their troop size because they're f feeling nervous that someone else plans to invade them, both actions. Uh, so if I'm nervous that someone's going to be invading me or if I plan to invade somebody else, increasing the number of troops I have is a reasonable action. Right, so from just seeing the action, right, it's very difficult to know what their intent is. And they could say whatever they want, but talk is cheap, right? So how do we know they're actually telling us the truth, right? Uh, so even if we, um, and even if we think that we know the intentions of another state, and even if we think that their intentions are um, similar to our own, or, or you know, um, are aligned with our own today, that can change tomorrow. Um, and it could change tomorrow for any number of reasons, right? It could change tomorrow because of changing conditions, right? Because the situation changes. It could change because yeah, look at uh, um, look at electoral politics, right? Like um, today, you know, a few years ago, you had uh, President Obama, then you have Donald Trump, and now you have um, Joe Biden as president, right? Each of them have different interests, right? So Obama may have had certain intentions to behave in a certain way, but then um, uh, uh, Trump has different intentions, right? Um, and so they could change. You may have had, you know, harmony of interest with Obama, but then Trump comes in and it changes. So if you're relying on the US, right, all of a sudden that may no longer be a reliable partner. Similarly, if you had, you know, good relations uh, and uh, and uh, with uh, President Trump, Joe Biden, when he comes uh, coming in, could change everything there. So rather than focusing on intention, states focus on the capabilities of others, right? Because capabilities are, for the most part, knowable. And there's many states out there who could have capabilities to hurt you. Um, so the international environment could be th um, could have many threats. So due to the self-help nature and presence of constant threats, states pursue competitive policies, right? So they're um, rather than a lot of cooperation because uh, cooperation um, is, is kind of a departure from self-help and because you don't know the intentions of others um, and because they could end up re you know, reneging um, and leaving you vulnerable, states have to be largely competitive. So it's a competitive environment. That doesn't mean always mean, again, war. Right, but it means it's a competitive environment where states have to look out for, for number one. Um, so a hegemon, which is a state with the preponderance of power, um, could threaten the security existence of other states. Um, therefore, states balance against power. Right. So a hegemon is a state that even a coalition of other states working together would not be strong enough to overcome. Right, it would be a single state um, that is so powerful that no other group could uh, go against it. And remember that the primary goal in neorealism is security. Right, so if there's a state that is sufficiently strong that no other balancing group, no other group of states could um, band together to oppose, right, that state could do whatever it wants, and um, now it, it may let you live in peace for fi fine, but you'd be completely at um, its whims. So you would no longer have any control over your security and potentially your existence. Um, and so this is kind of the viewed in neorealism as kind of the, uh, for states as the ultimate evil, right? States are always trying to make ensure that there's no um, hegemon, right? Because at that point, if there's no hegemon, then there's some configuration of states together where you could maintain your security, you can maintain your existence, right? You could work with other states who are similarly threatened by other states and you could oppose those other states and you can maintain your security. If there's a hegemon, if one state gets too powerful where you can no longer do that, 
then you have no control anymore. Um, so state balance against power. They try to make sure that nobody gets overly powerful. Um, so methods of balancing. So first is internal balancing. Um, and there's entire literature on whether internal or external is better. Um, they ha each have costs and benefits. Uh, so internal balancing, building arms, increasing size of armies, so building up new weapons or increasing the number of soldiers that you have, right? So if um, I'm Germany and I see um, France as a threat and France is growing in strength and I'm worried that France is going to invade, right? Um, how do I uh, make sure that France doesn't get too strong? Well, I can build up my army so that I can impose, uh, oppose France myself. Um, the other thing that I can do is I can form uh, an alliance. So say again, France is growing too strong and I'm Germany watching, right? I can say, um, hey, uh, I, I could build up an army or I can say, hey, um, UK, France is going really, really strong. They're threat they could threaten us, right? They have the capabilities to hurt us, but they also have the capabilities to hurt you. So what do we make it, why don't we make an alliance saying, you know, um, if France attacks one of us, the other one intervene because it's in your best interest to do so. Because if they, you know, say they could say the UK, if they get rid of us, they're even stronger. They could already beat you, but if they take over us, they're even stronger. And then there's nothing you can do to stop them from taking over you. So why don't we make an alliance and work together? Um, so again, there's certain advantages to both, right? Internal balancing is great from the sense that, um, it, from a self-help perspective, you're not relying on anybody else whatsoever. So from that perspective, internal balancing is really, really good. Um, from other perspectives, um, internal balancing is costly, right? You've got to spend money on building arms, increasing size of army, plus there's limits, right? Um, there's only, any state can only reach a certain strength, right? So for example, Canada, say um, Canada want to be balancing against the United States. Um, Canada has severe limitations to how strong he could get vis-a-vis -vis the United States. At a certain point, even if everybody in um, Canada were part of the army, right? That would be 37 million strong army. The US has a population of 300 something million, right? So yes, their army is not 30 something million, but they could easily get up to, if Canada were able to get up to an army of 37 million, the US could easily do so, and then more so. Uh, so there's a limit to how much it's costly and there's limits to what we can do. The risk to alliances, so the benefits to alliances, it's cheaper, right? You don't necessarily have to increase your army size. Um, um, you could also get much stronger than what you could do yourself, right? So Canada could work with someone who's stronger and get stronger, you know, than we ever could internally. The risk is in terms of, you know, sometimes alliances uh, break apart or allies sometimes when you when it, uh, uh, don't step up when an ally gets invaded. So, you know, it, France could invade Germany and the UK at the end of the day says, yeah, we understand that this is risky for us, but we're going to stay out and hope that France doesn't turn its attention to us next, right? Because it's a departure from self-help, you're relying on somebody else, and that's always risky because you don't know the intentions of others. Um, you don't know what at the end of the day you're going to end up deciding. It does bring in an element of risk. Um, so there's costs and benefits to both. And throughout human history, if you look at different uh, conflicts or the lead up to different conflicts or configuration of power, you see attempts at internal balancing against potential other threats, against other accumulations of power. But you also see patterns of alliances against other threats. So um, next we're gonna talk about balance of power. Now it's important to, to recognize that balance of power and balancing are separate, right? Balancing is the process of, okay, so one side, one state is bigger than the other. So how do I make it so that I'm of equal strength so that they don't get a preponderance of power. Or one, uh, it, it could be an action by one group of states um, against another group, um, but it's, it's involving actions to try to make it so that power is equal um, so that you can ensure your security, or at least to make sure that it's, no state has a preponderance of power. Um, so it's an action, either in terms of you know, building up your own arms or forming alliances. 
balance of power is talking about the distribution of capabilities. So remember, one of the ordering principles was, um, was in terms of the distribution of capabilities, and we talked about how we look at the number of great powers. And so we refer to kind of the distribution of capabilities as the balance of power within the system. Um, so, uh, so distribution of capabilities within the system depends on the polarity, um, the number of great powers of the system. Um, so when we talk about the number of great powers, we end up talking about uh, the polarity of system. So neorealism expects different patterns of behavior depending on the polarity of the system, right? Um, so states will always try to maintain equal balance of power, but depending on the balance of power, whether there's a high number of great powers or a small number of great powers or one great power uh, even, we could expect a difference um, in, in terms of behavior or different patterns of behavior. So one of the main things that you're looking at when you're looking at any particular international system is what is the balance of power? What is the polarity within the system? Um, so multipolar systems, when we talk about polarity, we don't just say five versus four versus three versus two number of great powers. We typically, um, when we talk about polarity, put it into three possibilities. Is it a multipolar system? Um, and so multipolar would be three plus great powers. And so we, you could think about examples here of pre-World War I European state system, interwar, so between World War I and World War II inter, uh, war international system. So let's take the lead up, say, to World War I, um, and largely within the European context, because it was a largely European-centered war, right? We could say you had the UK, you had Germany, you had France, you had Russia as great powers. Um, Italy, perhaps, as a great power, uh, depending on how you measure. Um, interwar period, uh, again, you, uh, you have U, uh, UK, you'd have to be expanding out to the US, France, Germany, Russia, Japan, maybe, right? But there's multiple states that we could say are really important, have a large number of power, could really influence international politics, uh, and who are cut above all of the other states in terms of their power. Bipolar system means there's only two great powers. And so here we'd be talking about the Cold War period. This is actually a very re a relatively rare configuration of power um, historically, but bipolar system, 1945-ish, um, it took a little bit of time maybe after 1945 for the U uh, USSR to really establish itself perhaps. So 1945-ish to around the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. Um, so around the Cold War period. And so this was a time of two great powers. And so again, we would expect based on balance of power, we would expect different configurations of behavior in a multipolar to a bipolar era. And then unipolar system is when there's one great power. So it's not a hegemony where one is say stronger than all of the other possible configurations of power. So that they could threaten anybody and do whatever they want. It's more that there's just one power that is a cut above everyone else. Um, and so from 1991, arguably to today, um, the US is that cut above. Now I put a question mark for kind of the end period, um, partially because there's a debate as to when the unipolar moment will end or the unipolar kind of uh, balance, uh, balance of power will end. Um, uh, it could be in the future, in which case the question mark would be appropriate. Um, some say that um, we're already back into a multipolar world with China, China in particular, but also possibly Russia or the EU as being other poles, um, other kind of great powers. Um, there's intense debate within IR as to what the system actually currently is between, it's definitely not bipolar, um, but whether it's multipolar or unipolar, it inspires a lot of debate. And given the different expectations about these two different systems, um, it's also a very important question. Um, but it's not one I'm gonna try to answer. Um, there's good arguments on both sides. Um, and, and part of it comes down to how you measure power, right? So militarily, I think it would still be fairly clear to say that we're in a unipolar international system. The US military, well, despite, advance, despite some resurgence in Russia and despite advances in uh, the Chinese military, rapid advances in the Chinese military, the US is still by far the strongest military in the world. Um, if we're talking economically, right, and um, 
uh, and economy is very important uh, in terms of power resources, in, in particular, not least because of it, it allows you to um, internally balance, right? You can increase your um, your weapons capacity um, through economic resources. Economically, it looks more like a multipolar system, right? The U.S. is not is the largest economy, but it's not heads and it's not massively ahead of China uh, and the EU, right? There we'd kind of be looking at a uh, if you could accept the EU as being one entity, it's not leagues ahead of the other two. Um, so in that case, it looks like a multipolar system. So at, at the end of the day, do we put it as unipolar because of the military or multipolar because of the economy is, is a debatable, um, but it's a debate that does exist currently. Um, now, there's also some debate in neorealism as to what is the most stable um, of, of these. Um, most neorealists come down on the argument that the bipolar international system um, is most stable. And this is something that we will probably return to a little bit later in the course, um, but it's not, it's not something too important for your purposes. Um, that the bipolar um, uh, system is the most stable, right? Because um, each side is clear in terms of who they need to balance against. Um, each relies on their own resources to internally balance. There's a few misperceptions um, because, you know, all the other sides, the US in balancing against the Soviet Union, the US, yes, it had allies, but they were so much weaker compared to itself and the Soviet Union that it largely had to rely on itself, right? So even if the allies defected, it wasn't that important. Um, and so, um, uh, it was easier for to, to understand what needed to be done. Same thing for the Soviet Union. It had allies, but largely it knew that if it wanted to balance against the U.S., it had to do so itself, right? And so it was easier to maintain that kind of understanding of what needed to be done. And so it's less likely to end up with an accidental imbalance of power, but also misperceptions. The argument in multipolar systems is because you have a, a combination of internal balancing and external balancing, it's harder to A, perceive are the different alliances equally balanced, but it's also um, harder to know what the strength of an alliance is, is because at the end of the day, you don't know if all the allies, if conflict actually breaks out, will one ally defect? just it won't show up to the war or will it actually fight for the other side because it thinks it, by switching sides it can lead to being on the winning side because it there's more chance of misperception or more uncertainty multipolar systems can be um more stable there are others and classical realists often uh, take this perspective uh, but there's other neorealists who do too who view multipolar systems as actually more stable than bipolar systems um but again most but Again, for, for the understanding of neorealism, it's less, those arguments are less important. It's more to understand that in this case, it's these questions about the distribution of capabilities because that's the only changeable part in the international stru structure, right? Anarchy and states being functionally identical stays the same. These are the only things that could really be explaining changes in the international system. So the polarity, the balance of power, how many great powers there are, um, and the strength of these different great powers is the only thing that can really be explaining from within the neorealism camp, the um, changes in patterns of behavior. So how many wars there are, a uh, cause of conflict and cooperation. Finally, just wanna to touch briefly on the security dilemma. So the security dilemma explains why even states that have no aggressive intentions may end up in a crisis or war, right? So um, sometimes you end up with states that if, if you actually kind of look at it at the end, they didn't plan to attack it, uh, each other. Um, they didn't um, have any aggressive intentions towards each other, but at the end of the day, they end up fighting a war or at least ending up in a crisis. Um, and the reason being is that, uh, again, we don't know the intentions of others. So when we're assessing with, with a new realism, when we're assessing other states, we look at their capabilities. Um, so steps taken to ensure one's own security decreases the security of the others. So say I'm a country uh, and I'm feeling insecure. So let's go back to France, Germany, neighbors again, so, um, and both great powers. So say France is feeling insecure about um, it, you know, its security situation, either because of, um, you know, it could be fearing Germany, it's 
you know, security situation vis-a-vis -vis Germany, but it could also say be fearing a security situation vis-a-vis -vis the UK. Um, so say France decides it needs to increase its security position. It has no ingress, it, it, it has no desire to expand, right? Um, it just feels insecure itself vis-a-vis -vis its security position with, you know, its neighbors. So it decides it's going to increase um, the size of its capabilities. Germany looks at this and say it doesn't know France's intentions and it can't know France's intention. It, um, it doesn't know if France plans to attack or is just doing this for defensive purposes. So all Germany can look at is the balance of power between the two, right? Um, who it is, um, who's stronger um, between them. What it, um, and it sees that France's um, military power has increased. Therefore, Germany now feels less secure. Um, balance of capabilities has shifted in France's favor. So by necessity then, Germany, if we're only looking at capabilities, is less secure. So what is rational for Germany to do? Well, Germany will increase its own um, security, or its own resources, right? Um, will work to increase its own security, uh, possibly by internally balancing, possibly by external balancing, to at least get back to, you know, the level that it had before where it was comfortable. But now when it does this, France is once again unsure of why Germany has done this. It doesn't know again if it's a, if it, to, you know, just increase its own security or whether, whether it has aggressive tensions. But all it now knows is that it's less strong than it would like to be, right? Its power capabilities are now weaker than what it thinks it, it needs to feel secure. So France, um, will again increase um, its, uh, its own weapons, right? And so this could lead into an arms race where each side keeps on increasing its own capabilities. And the fear here is that through this process of increasing weaponry and this you know, uh, continued process of viewing the other as potentially having aggressive intentions and potentially trying to use its um, it's weapons to harm you, that they'll end up kind of falling into a war, a war that nobody really wanted, but because of the, the fear and the perceived threat uh, and the constant increasing and changing threat, that states will kind of end up fighting a war that they know uh, neither wanted. The security uh, dilemma does depend on a few factors, um, and these in, um, are termed in terms of offense and defensive advantage. Um, so if it's easier to defend than it is to attack, even if the other side increases its capabilities, if it's easier for you to, um, to defend, even this increase in capabilities um, is even a, a large increase in capabilities will only require a small increase in defensive capabilities to, um, to counter, right? So it's less, you're less fearful if another side increases its capabilities because um, even if it plans to attack you, it requires very less effort to, um, to counter. The other being offense, defense, distinguishability, right? So if there's a difference between offensive weapons and defensive weapons, then you could know the intention of another state, right? Because if they build offensive weapons, then you know that they're planning an attack. If they build defensive weapons and only defensive weapons, then, um, uh, then you know that they're just hoping to improve their security, but they have no intention of attacking, right? So you could feel more secure. And so it doesn't have to bring about a security dilemma. An increase in defensive weapons doesn't have to provoke um, the rush to increase your own security or a feeling of insecurity. Um, the problem is I, I often kind of poll students in, in class at this point, and I challenge them to name a defensive weapon versus an offensive weapon. What is a purely offensive weapon? What is a defensive weapon? And there's some decent answers, right? There's some decent answers that, um, that you can give, particularly in terms of you know, a uniquely defensive weapon. But in almost all the cases, I can tell you a story about how this could be used in an offensive strategy, right? So think about a wall, um, right? Wall sounds, it's immovable, it can't be used to defend, right? But a wall, um, can have offensive um, purposes. First, a quick to erect wall could be used after an, an attack 
right, to consolidate your territory. So you attack, you take a little bit of territory, and then you build a wall quickly to defend that territory, defend against counterattack. So that's a way that a wall could be used in an offensive strategy. A wall too, even if it's, you know, a wall that takes a long time to build, right? If the wall is really strong at defending, right, it frees up resources to engage in attack. So say along your southern front, you build a really uh, strong wall. And so you feel secure about your southern front. You could move troops who were formerly defending the southern front up to a different, up to the eastern front um, to engage in an attack, right? Um, so even in this case, the wall could be still used as part of an offensive strategy. Um, forts, again, um, typically similar uh, logic, often thought of defensive, but a quick to build fort fortifications um, can um, be used um, to hold newly taken territory, um, but it also could be used to free up troops to engage in offensive activities elsewhere. Um, so most weapons that we could go through, and we could go through all the lists, you could usually tell a story about how it may seem more defensive, it may seem more offensive, but you could still tell a story about how it could be used in an offensive or defensive strategy. Um, in even offensive weapons, right? Even a purely defensive country would need some form of offensive weapon, right? Because what happens if another t country attacks, they gain some of your territory. To, to defend that territory, you would need some offensive weapons to push them back. So say they take 10% of your territory. Well, you're gonna, if you want to retake that territory, which is still part of defending your homeland, you're going to need offensive weapons to push back against that attack. So even these offensive weapons could be used purely as part of a defensive strategy. Um, so these are things that come into play in terms of looking at the security dilemma um, as to, you know, um, whether we think security dilemma will operate at any given time. Um, and both are important, particularly off, uh, but both can also um, lead into problems. So that's a, uh, I know that we covered a lot here. Um, we'll return to it when we have a discussion about the different theories so we can talk about any questions. Also, feel free in office hours to ask any questions. Um, but as we go through more and more um, different theories um, and as we start seeing applications, um, a lot of this will become more clear. So don't panic if, a lot, if there's a lot that happened in, in today's lecture. Um, that's fine. You're, you're still fine. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, it's normal to be a little bit overwhelmed um, after the first few classes, um, but things will slow down and things will start making more sense um, with time. So have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, I'll see you next class.